We click on the subscribe button, especially the bell on the right side. Otherwise, you will miss the latest videos. Good morning, Nick. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. Thank, Thank you. you, Mohan. Thank you for having me. We are pleased All to right. have you here. And I think this is your first exposure to us. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I will allow you to introduce yourself so that you can speak the most of what you really are. But I will tell the public what I know of you. I know that okay. you have a very good sense of humor and <laughs> your research is very, very deep. And today you have chosen the topic synodic uh, periods of Venus, if I am right. Yes. And uh, let me tell the audience that uh, his knowledge is so deep that the rumor is that the planets intimate Nick before changing their directions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'll explain a bit about myself. Yeah. I'm, um, I, astrology is, uh, amongst other things, a calendar system. And I've always been very interested, as someone who's interested in history, um, in the calendar, in the way it demarcates time, in the way it explain it, it allows us to look at time in some kind of appreciable, measurable way. And um, the astrological calendar, and this is true for whichever zodiac one uses, whichever system one okay. uses, these are all variants of a calendar system, a very intricate one, one that assigns a unique value to every moment in time, which is really intriguing to me. Um, so along with everything else, why I am a working astrologer, I read horoscopic astrology. Um, I've always been interested in the cycles of planets okay. and particularly for about the last 20 years, I've been studying the cycles of Venus and Mars very closely in an astrological context mm -hmm. with regard to human history. Certainly, I mean, that's a big job. History is a, is a massive yes. project. So I, I am, my expertise, if you will, um, is limited to from, say, the 19th century until the modern period. So I'm not someone who's very capable of explaining what went on a thousand years ago, but when it goes back about 200 years, I have a reasonably good idea of what was happening astrologically, what was happening in the world. Um, and, what, and drew, what drew you into point. astrology in the first place? Um, well, I, I think like uh, I, apparently my story is not unique. I, mm -hmm. I was initially very skeptical, as I mm -hmm. think a reasonable person would be. Um, I don't. I think if you think of the notion of astrology just from a, um, an everyday perspective, it does seem a bit outlandish uh, to 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 advance as a as, a, as an idea. Um, but just really by fluke, I started reading a few astrology books, really just so I would know enough mm -hmm. about the subject in order to be able to argue with people who, who were more invested in it than I was. And, and it just wound up being some, one of those things that I, I've heard this story from many other people since that uh, I just wound up being a convert instead. Uh, but the thing that drew me to astrology was in fact the, the way it functions as a calendar. I was already someone who had hundreds if not thousands of calendar dates memorized mm. uh, in history and friends birthdays even though i wasn't into astrology i was the kind long before we had social media back in the you know 80s and 90s i was someone who always knew when my friends birthdays were or even when my teachers mm -hmm. birthdays were and i'd say happy birthday and they wouldn't understand how i would remember that kind of thing but i just I'm one of those people, and it's a trait that runs in my family. Okay. If my brother, if my brother was an astrologer, he would also be the kind of astrologer I am, who's very drawn to the calendar-like um, uh, qualities of of, okay. uh, of astrology. What um, system so do you follow? 
Um, I'm a I'm a Western uh, astrologer who uses okay. tropical uh, zodiac, but I am very interested in, in the Indian Vedic system. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in other zodiacs other than the one that I'm uh, that that I use specifically in my practice for horoscopic chart readings. Uh, but I think actually it's a it's a good question here because the beauty of what I'm going to be presenting you to you today is that this is this is astrology that um, anticipates horoscopic astrology, but it does not need to be used necessarily in a horoscopic okay. system. I think it lends itself very well to any horoscopic system. Um, but this is very sort of simple, basic knowledge about planetary cycles. And okay. I, I have every reason to believe, and I, I, I've never found anyone to argue with me that Whoever invented horoscopic astrology, whoever were the great thinkers who, who designed either one system or, or all the systems that we're using, they most likely knew this information that I've been studying for these past 20 years. And in other words, if horoscopic astrology didn't exist, my method is to, to stumble upon the way that one would invent it if it didn't already exist. And I think studying these planetary cycles is, is certainly something, something that was being done for thousands of years, long before someone thought of the idea of um, calculating a horoscope, a birth chart for a specific individual. First thing you would do long before you got around to, to doing that is to just follow the planets through time and get some idea of how they correspond to events on Earth and events in people's lives. I always so believed... Basically. You know, in my case, I've always believed uh, astrology to be very much like a science. You know, the space-time mm. matrix, the synergy between mm -hmm. space-time is what is really, really coming out and depicted very, very clearly in astrology. Yeah, I, I have every reason to believe that it is a natural phenomenon. Um, the, the systems, the horoscopic systems, be they a, a Vedic system or a Western system, these are systems The people design those, but they design them in order to understand a natural phenomenon. And I think that's what we're really looking at, and especially this work that I'm showing you today. This is why I say that the Zodiac doesn't necessarily matter. This, this, this can be used in any zodiacal context. And in fact, when I get to, when I get to specific examples in, in part two of our conversation, I'll be showing you charts of people and I'll be showing the trop position of Venus at a given moment, but I'll also show the nakshatra sure. that, it, that it occupied at that time, because it's really, at this point, we're just looking for a, a space on the, on the ecliptic that we Correct. can identify, and whatever name we give it is, is um, academic, is, insofar as this uh, presentation is going to go. Yeah, so um, that's basically it. It's, it's interesting material. Uh, it's very simple. That In this first half, I'm really just going to be explaining what I do and, and how I've broken the system down. I've basically invented, if you will, <laughs> a, a new kind of zodiac, as if mm -hmm. we didn't have enough. <laughs> um, but it's not really a zodiac in that it doesn't have animal symbols or mm -hmm. anything like that to describe the various parts. Uh, I only mean it's like a zodiac in the sense that I've taken uh, a, a period of time and I've divided it into equal measures, in this okay. case, 20 measures. Um, and, and in that sense, which is, once you strip away the, the ideas of, of uh, symbolism and, and all those components of the Zodiac, what you essentially have is a, a, an equal division of, of a period of time. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the similar thing that I'm doing here. Um, so a, any further all questions? Over you? No, all over to you. Eagerly <laughs> waiting. Okay, well, I'm going um, yeah. to hit the share screen thing here. Um, so you can see what I'm looking at here, the, yeah, the pentagram, an yes. introduction to the nautic cycle of Venus. Yeah. And um, basically, this is, this is what Venus looks like. Now, um, the word synod is from the Greek synodos for meeting place. And it, it, in astrology, it refers to a cyclical relationship between two bodies. In this case, of course, I'm talking about the Venus and the sun. So we're following not just Venus in its pattern, but Venus relative to the sun in all this time. Right. And I just want to give you, I'm going to show you a very quick um, video here 
this is a, an astronomy video. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's Venus passing the sun in what we would call an exterior conjunction. Right. Uh, and then nine months later, it sort of slows down and it appears to do this loop backwards and then it moves forward again. You saw the sun passed it while it was doing yes. that loop. And now Venus again accelerates, catches up, makes another exterior conjunction with the sun. And then another nine months later, it's going to make another one of these right. loops goes backwards and you see it made an interior conjunction with the sun right. while it's going backwards. It makes another conjunction with the sun. Now this process goes onward and onward. Now we're coming up to another exterior conjunction. This whole video clip that I'm showing you, um, the duration of this is about eight years, hmm. um, eight years of, of life on earth. And you can see there it's made another retrograde loop. That's, that's what we call those loops. Those are yeah. retrogrades from uh, an earth perspective. It looks like Venus is slowing down. Uh, turning direction and then passing the sun and then yeah. turning around and moving direction and changing speed as you can see it seems yeah. to accelerate as it as it heads towards the sun and then as it's heading towards one of these loops it, it appears to decelerate to slow down and, and, and make these little turns you can see it's going very fast as it passes the sun again now the interesting thing about these loops that Venus makes if you measure if you take eight years and you, you just one eight-year period, there are five of these loops. Right. Yes. There's a train going by me outside. A little I can do about that if your mic's picking that up. Anyway, um, there are five of these Venus retrograde loops um, in an eight-year period. Yeah. There are also five of the exterior conjunctions in an eight-year eight period. And uh, there we are. That's that's the that's the video. Correct. Um, and um, I'll just stop share for a second as I explain this, yeah. if I can. There's my. Yeah. Okay. So imagine, if you will, if, if this white circle represents eight years. It's actually eight years minus two days, right. which is 2,920 days. That's the duration of one entire Venus synodic cycle. Right. Um, now, I, what we're looking at mostly in this talk is going to be the retrograde part of the synodic right. cycle, but I really want to talk about the whole cycle. The retrograde, as you saw in those clips, Venus as an evening star, um, in the sense, it's, I'll explain what an evening star is just now, but um, Venus as an evening star appears to gradually decelerate to a stop, reverse motion, accelerate backwards, vanish from the sky, reach its solar interior conjunction. The interior conjunction meaning Venus is actually closest to earth okay. when venus is making those loops this is when yes. venus is closest to earth so it's between us and the sun and that's why it appears to slow down and change speed and all this stuff and for a little while it vanishes and it stops being an evening star and then it reverses motion again accelerates forward and rises as a morning star and then mm. advances towards the next solar exterior conjunction okay. which is when it's on the other side oh, of the okay. sun and and not retrograde and that and these happen in these nine month intervals. So there'll be a retrograde and then an exterior conjunction. And those are nine months, nine months. If you break down those eight years, you get five of both. Um, so what I've done is um, I can I've broken down that two thousand nine hundred twenty days. I've broken it into groups of twenty. Okay. Um, and and the five red periods here are the retrograde phases. So you can see they form what, what, what effectively becomes a five-pointed star. In fact, I'm going to show you quickly a video I have. Where is it? Yeah. I had read somewhere as 1.6 years, so it is somewhere matching to that. 1.6 years. Yes. Um, that, that might be from a zodiacal position to a zodiacal okay. position. Yeah. Um, now, I'm just going to show you this. Yes. This motion here. Now, that's tropical Aries. So, yes. of course, in the sidereal zodiac, it's, it's closer to Pisces. And the, the movement moves like this. In other words, you get these, the, the retrogrades happen in what amounts to a sort of five pointed star design. You see, as it's doing yes. here. Perfect. And in fact, I mean, I have every reason to believe, I think there's, there's no sort of written proof of this because it's so old, but. I think it's quite reasonable to surmise that the very reason that we have a five-pointed star image, you know, 
the flag of China, the flag of the Soviet Union, or, or the flag of the United States. Flags all over the world have this five-pointed star. It's a very universal symbol yes. that we have around the world. Pentagram. And um, I have every reason to believe, and I think a lot of people do accept, that um, this five-pointed star design that's a universal, one of the, the most, if not the most universal symbol in the world, represents the Venus synodic cycle. That's how old this this uh, knowledge is. And when you think about it, Venus as a star, you know, the ancients used to think of the planets as stars because yes. they look like stars in the sky. The only difference is they move, and Venus sure. is the brightest of them all. You get the sun, the moon, and then Venus. And, yeah. and so Venus, in a, in a way, represents all stars. And and um, and that five-pointed image being the, the reason why we, we associate it with stars, even though when we look at the lights in the sky, they never seem to have these five points, right. but that's where this design comes from. All right, so um, this is good. This is um, the nice thing about talking to you about this is it helps yeah. me structure this presentation in a way rather than go eventually going back and forth. So um, as I've been saying, um, the slow motion Venus retrograde phases occur in five near equidistant periods during its, its synodic cycle. And right. That's where you get that five pointed star design. Um, now, the retrograde period itself, when it's actually doing those loops back and forth, that's about 40 to 43 days mm -hmm. um, in itself. But I also basically look at periods leading up to the retrograde and periods following the retrograde and, and call that the retrograde phase. Yes. Um, what I've done is I've basically broken it down to 146 days. Okay. If you multiply 146 times 20, you get 2,920. Right. So in other words, not only have I, um, the, not only is the Venus retrograde phase as I'm describing it, the, the leading up as it slows down to the retrograde, does its little loop and then moves away. Right. I, using the interior conjunction as a sort of center, 73 days on either side of the interior conjunction, that's what I'm calling a Venus retrograde phase, okay. a total of 146 days. So when you think about 146 days is an average of 5% of an eight-year period. So if I'm talking about just one of those 20 groups, yes. that's 5% not just of an eight-year period, but 5% of all time, for as long as Venus and the Sun have had this relationship from, from Earth. Right. Um, and if I'm talking about all Venus retrograde phases, that's a total of 730 days, that's still just 25% of an eight-year period or of overall time. Um, and I'm giving you these, these ratios because later on I'm going to show you uh, in a lot of biographies and, and, in, and in sort of uh, world history, how this relatively small percentage of time seems to show up in a, in a, uh, in a volume far higher than these small 5 or 25% percentages. And that's why this material is interesting and, right. and, and useful to astrologers. So again, this, this idea of the five-pointed path in the sky, um, right. I'm just illustrating here what, how that's drawn about. But what I've done here is I'm not just looking, the red periods represent the retrogrades, but I've actually assigned colors to all 20 of these groups, mm -hmm. well, of, of these phases, if you will. There are four color groups right. um, and five of each. So it works out very symmetrically in a very nice, Venus is all about symmetry after right. all. So it's, um, it's convenient the way it works out symmetrically. So the five... Uh, the five red squares, as you see, are the retrograde phases. The five blue squares, which you can see are, are always about two before and two after the red ones, yes. those represent the exterior conjunctions, the periods when Venus is furthest from Earth, whereas the red periods are when Venus is closest to Earth. Um, the red periods are always followed by a white period. The white period represents the morning star phase, and I'll get into, a, into what the morning star means yeah. just now. In a, in a moment. Um, and then the black phases, which follow the blue period and lead to the red periods, are the evening star phases. Right. So obviously I chose, I chose white for morning and black for evening because those are obvious <laughs> color okay, associations. Yes. Um, I chose red for the retro... Seem to and I chose these, these four color groups and yeah. chose the colors. The white is for the morning star, the black is for the evening star. Red is for the retrogrades because those loops are a bit more of a disruption in the right. in the in the cycle, and then the blues, 
more of a harmonious uh, color, so that represents the exterior conjunction when Venus and the Sun are moving together in the same direction and, and what have you. So those, right. that's the reason for my choice. So you can see that I've broken down those, those 20 parts into this very nice symmetrical right. um, pattern here. So the, the 2,920 days of one Venus sonotic cycle yeah. can be evenly divided into 20 parts of 146. Um, okay, so as I, as I was just explaining, the red sections, um, evening to morning star, right. slow retrograde motion. The white sections are morning star, which is a gradual acceleration of Venus. The blue sections are when Venus moves from morning to evening star, when it passes over the sun in direct motion, fast direct yes. motion. It's always accelerating as it reaches the sun and then starts to slow down as soon as that conjunction is made. And then the black sections are the evening star, when it gradually decelerates, gradually reduces speed, heading towards its eventual next red section, where it's going to go from evening star to morning star again. And the cycle just repeats, repeats, repeats. So again, it's very nice and even. And now what I've done is, because this cycle repeats in eight years, I've also assigned numbers to right. um, these, these, these groups, and I'll explain the numbers. Um, again, I am using the tropical zodiac, but I think even a lot of Vedic astrologers understand can relative, with relative ease uh, um, translate a yes. tropical position to a sidereal position. Um, so in the 21st century, the, the red one group has been in Pisces, mm -hmm. uh, the red and blue group, uh, and, and it, whereas in the 20th century, it was in Aries. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see, can I move this out of the way? Can you see the whole, whoops. Yeah. Um, you can see the whole thing. Okay, so um, in the 20th century, the gr one group has been in Aries. Right. And back in the 19th century, it was in Taurus because with every eight year return, it always, the, it always, it always falls about two to three days and two to three zodiacal degrees earlier than the yes. previous time. So there was a gradual shift over time. Again, um, so the two group um, in the 21st century is going into Libra. In the mm -hmm. 20, most of the 20th century, it's been in Scorpio. And in the 19th century, it was in Sagittarius. Mm. Uh, the third group is uh, presently in Gemini. Up until about 1988, it was always in Cancer. And then prior to that, in the 19th century, it was in Leo, mm. tropical Leo. Uh, the fourth group, Capricorn in the 21st, Aquarius in the 20th, uh, and Pisces in the 19th. And then the 21st century group five has been Leo, uh, is Leo now. Uh, it used to be Virgo in the 20th century. Mm. In the 19th century, it was Libra. So that's the, the breakdown there. Right. Um, now, what I've done is I've also assigned numbers to the white and black group, but they just basically follow their, the, the white numbers follow the red numbers the right. same, and uh, the, the black numbers follow the blue numbers the same. So um, right now, as you and I speak, Mohan, we have we are in a blue four period. Right. Um, back back in April, we were in a red one period, and then moving into the summer months in the norm, uh, in the northern hemisphere, we moved into a white one period. I think right. we left the white one period back in October at the end of October. So now we're in a blue four period, which means that we are going to have an uh, an exterior conjunction in Capricorn. You can see four in the yeah. 21st century. We're going to have an exterior conjunction um, in Capricorn shortly as, as the Sun and Venus get close. So they're already quite close as you and I speak. Um, then going into this year, later this year, we'll, we'll be in, a, in an evening star four period, which follows this blue four period. And then um, when we get to the um, autumn months of 2018 in the Northern Hemisphere or the Spring months. I'm in Cape Town, South Africa, in the Southern Hemisphere mm -hmm. here, so uh, it's 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 not the autumn; it's the spring here. But in any case, when when we get to just less than a year from now, about nine months from now, uh, September October 2018, we move into a red two. That'll be the next loop, and that occurs now in Scorpio, moving into Libra because the the retrograde motion right. moves from tropical Scorpio into tropical Libra, and so on and so forth. So you can see there's that that. This this particular diagram gives you it breaks down that eight year period again that one circle represents eight years it breaks them down into twenty and this is just giving you uh, the the chronological order of these um, various phases within the the overall uh, synodic cycle. Sure. 
Um, and I'll be getting into more of these as you see it, but I just, I right. wanted you to see it in the context. Um, now, I think I already showed you, I showed yes. you that diagram, so I'm yes. going to skip that. Because um, I've already shown you that. I'm, like I said, I'm learning the sequence yeah. here. Um, okay, and, and this information I've already given to you, so I'm going to move right into here and give yeah. you an idea um, of how the conjunctions work because this is this is the magic um, we have exterior conjunctions and interior conjunctions alternately every four years because yeah. because of the, the the opposition between the right. red and blue periods so right now we're looking at the red group and you can see back on March 25th 2017 we had an interior conjunction at the tropical degree of four Aries 57 hmm. Uh, which is quite close to where four years prior, March 28th, 2013, there was an exterior conjunction at eight Aries 10. Hmm. And then when you, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom of this diagram, right. of course, and then as you move up towards the top, you can see that the calendar days are a bit later and the zodiacal degrees are a bit later. And you can see those two to three day, two to three zodiacal right. degree permits there. So that's what those look like. Um, the blue phase, um, like I said, the conjunction in 2013 at 8 Aries 10, yeah. um, that's what the blue phase looks like, whereas the red phase, the, the retrograde station uh, this year in 2017 began at 13 tropical Aries and went direct at 26 tropical Pisces, right. whereas if you go back to 1905 to 1953, the, the cycle used to go from Taurus to Aries, and then if you go further back in time, to the late 18th, early 19th century, it used to go from Gemini, Gemini. to Taurus. So gradually over time, these things shift. Um, next, I've got number two, group number two. You can see um, that um, October 26, 2018, next year, we'll yeah. have an interior conjunction at three Scorpio. Whereas four years prior to that in 2014, we had uh, an exterior conjunction at one Scorpio 48 and so on and so forth. Uh, again, I'm reading from the bottom and yeah. looking up there. Um, the blue phase, so that's Scorpio, um, th those are the blue phases, and the um, red phases moving from 10 degrees Scorpio in 2018 to 25 Libra um, right. in, in um, 2018. But again, if we go further back in time um, to 1906 to 1954, this, um, this phase used to go from Sagittarius to Scorpio. And then if we go further back to the early 1800s, it used to go from Capricorn to Sagittarius. So again, I'm just illustrating these, yeah. these sort of shifts over time. Um, group number three, looking at the bottom, yeah. um, we will have an, an interior conjunction that will be a retrograde in the year 2020. I know that sounds like a really sci-fi kind of year, but yeah. it's, it's not that far away now. <laughs> um, so that conjunction uh, it will be at 13 Gemini, whereas... Um, two years ago, um, or nearly two years ago in 2016, we had an exterior conjunction at 16 Gemini. So you can see these move very close together. Yeah. Um, that's the blue three phase in Gemini. And similarly, the red three phase, Gemini in the, in the 20th century, uh, go, tw even 21st century, 2012. Uh, if we move back to 1988, it used to go from Cancer to Gemini. And then if we move further back still, from 1884 to 1924, this um, Red 3 group used to go make its retrogrades strictly in tropical Cancer. Right. Uh, all right. I'm just going to take you through the last two here. This is group number four. Yeah. Um, at the bottom there in the year 2022, uh, sounding even more futuristic. Uh, we had interior conjunctions at 18 Capricorn, hmm. whereas um, just earlier this year in 2018, back in January, uh, or sorry, what am I saying? <laughs> I'm losing track of time. Very shortly, January 9th, 2018, uh, <laughs> we're going to have an exterior conjunction at 18 right. Capricorn, which I was referring to earlier. And that's where we are right now. That's why we're in a blue four phase. You can yes. see that, that, that the, the date that we're closest to as we speak now. Um, so that's the blue four phase. Uh, 2010 was the last time we had that conjunction in, in January 2010 at 21 Capricorn. Yeah. Um, and then if we look at the red phases, we see indeed um, uh, 2013 to 2014, the retrograde was in Capricorn. Whereas um, if we go back to 
1966 to 2006, the retrograde used to go Aquarius to Capricorn. And if we go really far back to 1862 to 1910, the retrograde used to go from Pisces to Aquarius. All right, so just one last one of these groups to look at now. And this is uh, group five. Um, the next retrograde in group five will be 2023, a really long way away, mm -hmm. because just uh, two years ago, um, two retrogrades ago in, in August of 2015, we had a, an, an interior conjunction there at 22 Leo. And similarly on the left, you see these blue exterior conjunctions, 2019, 2011, 2003, so on and so forth. So I think these, these, that, these little diagrams give your viewers a sense of, yeah. of the, the regularity of the cycle, how, it's, how that eight year minus two day period yes. winds up playing out with all these conjunctions and these five pointed stars. So uh, yes, the, the blue five period in Leo 2011 and next time in 2019 and then retrogrades um, currently Virgo the Leo in 2015, but soon it's just gonna be Leo um, in the next time around. Right. Uh, whereas if we go further back, 1855 to 1903, it used to be Libra to Virgo and whoops and uh, so on and so forth. Okay. Right. Um, now, do do uh, do you have any questions before I go on? I'm, I've got a little bit more of just a, um, a, a sort of summary of what I see with the Venus cycle in general. But uh, I've just thrown you a lot of these different diagrams. Um, maybe I've been clear. Maybe I haven't been. Is it's there, been clear. There Basically, there is a rhythm, there is a pattern, and there is a yeah. uh, what I should say sym symmetry in its motion. Mm -hmm. So it's perfect. Yes, that's that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, so I wanted to speak a bit about um, the just sort of my my interpretation of, yeah. of Venus in a general sense. Um, all the all the planets have a sort of uh, a paradoxical nature to them. So even when I'm saying these things about Venus, it's important to know that that. Um, the very opposite concepts also sort of play into what Venus is about. Uh, but essentially Venus uh, has to do with, uh, with the function of unifying that which is different or divided. It's a unifying force right. as opposed to Mars, which I see as a separating force. So Venus is ultimately a unifying force. Um, and during the retrograde phase though, this is the thing is, is the, this is what I mean about a paradox. Um, is that Venus, the, the Venus retrograde can represent periods of disunity, but ultimately in the name of really forwarding peace. It's almost like a review. Yes. A review at looking at uh, um, what is acceptable, what is not. The, the easiest way to describe Venus is it's, uh, there's a social consensus involved. Uh, if everyone in a given society agrees on what the rules are, uh, what do children do, what do grown-ups do, what, uh, what is... What is uh, good behavior or bad behavior? And, and of course, these, these rules are different from society to society. And even within one society, these rules eventually change. Eventually, yeah. uh, you know, let's say a, a really simple example, Venus often has to do with the role of women in society. Right. Um, what women wind up doing, I mean, it, it applies to everybody, of course, but this is just the easiest way to explain it. Um, um, there is a, a sort of code in, in any given society of what is expected or, or, or not expected from a woman. But sometimes women uh, will, will say, well, I don't like this rule. I'm going to do something that changes, changes this. Um, it can be get a job or um, choosing not to marry or, or any, any of these things that, yes. that wind up just sort of gradually shifting the norm, the consensus, the, 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 the general agreement about what what is acceptable unacceptable behavior. So these sorts of things uh, um, that that's what the ret retrograde phase tends to coincide with is when harmony is is disrupted, but for the sake of perpetuating harmony. I know again that's that's sort of the paradox behind it. It's very true. Actually, in the last thirty years, India has seen a sea change in the role of its women. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Well, naturally, I mean, first of all, you've had. You've, you've, you've had a woman prime minister, yes. uh, unlike a lot of uh, people in the world. And when did Indira Gandhi become prime minister? Well, it was in early 1966 during the Red Four period, which is interesting because her father, Nehru, died 
18 months prior to when she became prime minister right. during the Red Three period. So you see, Nehru died during the Red Three, and then she became prime minister during the Red Four. So even just the, the, the act of a woman becoming leader of a country, and one in which women don't typically have advanced roles. Right. Um, although in 1966, I can barely think of any country in the world that had really an advanced role for women. But the, um, there you had, indeed, during the red phase, it's a, that's actually a very good example. India fits very well. Um, and then when you go further ahead into Indira Gandhi's political career, well, uh, in 1975, as we were going into a red five period, this is when the emergency was declared. Right. And when did the emergency end? I think it was March or April of 1977, Sorry. as we were going into the red one period. Right. So you can see how these, these periods connect to each other. Her father died during red three. She became prime minister in red four. Uh, she declared emergency in red five. The emergency ended in a red one. Um, and and when her uh, when her son died in a helicopter crash, that was in a red three, just like when her father had died in a red three 16 years earlier. You can fathom these 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 changes. Um, and I know also India went through profound um, political and economic changes in 1991. That, well, 91, I believe, in in the in the in the June of 91 when um, there yeah. was some economic thing. Um, and that was a red five period. So you can see like a lot of these things that, that, that change and in, in the, the, the time for change very often occurs around these. Actually, uh, there these was a time, uh, like you said, in 60s and 70s, it was unheard of a woman working in our society. It was thought mm. to be a sin virtually at that uh, point of time. Today, if sure. she's not working, it is thought to be a sin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a very similar Western society, too. It's it's only been a couple of generations. Really, it was the, the, the wars, the first and second yes. world wars. Uh, men had to go off and fight in the battle. Someone had to stay home and make, you know, armaments and airplanes and all this. And they hired women. And then when the wars ended, the women said, you know what, we actually like having jobs. Right. And so those those wars... Um, led to these these profound changes. In fact, the First World War even gave women the vote in a lot of countries, including my country, Canada and mm -hmm. Great Britain, the United States, um, which is another interesting thing about Venus. Um, we typically associate, I think, Mars with war, and it certainly does, but Venus has its own role with regard to war and, and the spoils of war, I think, is, is what you see. And um, following um, a lot of wars and, and uh, rebellions and things of this nature mm -hmm. according to the Venus cycle can be very, very interesting. And, and hopefully, um, in part two, I'll give it a chance to, to share some of that. But to, indeed, there's... there's um, these these things that change in society and certainly indeed when you think of a century like the 20th century when so much changed all over yes. the world uh following uh, uh these changes according to the venus cycle is is uh, proves to be very fruitful i agree because i think venus and mars being in opposite signs they have a role to play mm. yeah absolutely there's 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 some kind of uh, uh relationship between the two and yeah. Um, the cycle of Mars is also very interesting to me. I have a, a separate sort of study yeah. um, that I do with Mars. Although the thing I haven't arrived at yet with Mars that I hope to is I haven't been able to break it down into these nice symmetrical groups the way I have the Venus cycle. The Mars cycle is is asymmetrical. It's so different from Venus in that sense. Um, it doesn't conform very evenly yeah, uh, because, uh... to... Mars stays in one sign for a very long time and then moves in a hurry to complete its uh, journey. So it becomes this a bit is true. tricky. It, it does that, but also, um, unlike, like, as we've seen with the Venus cycle, it gradually shifts over time and moves from sign to sign. Um, but eventually, in the period of about 250 years, years you'll, you'll see an equal distribution of of Venus transiting through all of the signs. Right. Uh, it's, true, it's true in the 20th century, red one was in Aries and, and red three was in, in Cancer, but back in the 19th century, red one was in Taurus and red three was in Leo. And eventually those all sort of shift and the distribution is very even amongst those signs. Um, whereas um, with Mars, the distribution is not even at all. Every 15 to 17 years, there was always a Mars retrograde in, in tropical Virgo. Mm -hmm. um, and also, 
you know, uh, Mars and tropical Leo is also quite regular, 15 to 17 years. But Mars in tropical Aquarius around sidereal Capricorn, that retrograde takes 32 to 47 years to mm-hmm. occur. It's very, very rare. I know we're getting a little off script, but since we're talking about it, um, it's very, very rare for Mars to make a retrograde yeah. um, in that part of the zodiac. And this is true really as we go back hundreds of years. Um, so Mars spends a lot more time in, in tropical Leo or Virgo, Virgo and very little time in tropical Aquarius or Pisces, which I think is equally interesting as a sort of um, a contrast yeah. to the Venus cycle, if you will. And hopefully sometime we'll get a chance to talk more about sure. that. Um, just to, to get back on, on track with the phase here, yes. um, although I think we've, we've sort of extracted this idea, uh, Venus has a sort of, when it, excuse me, when it goes into this retrograde phase, there, it, there's something subversive about it. And by subversive mean it's, it's a challenge to the status quo. So there's an established order which represents Venus as a whole, but during those retrogrades, just like the, the cycle itself doing that loop, things get shaken, things get turned around. Um, and, and like you said, 20 years ago, a woman having a job or 40 years ago, a woman having a job is a scandalous thing. Yes. Now today, if she doesn't have a job, it's sort of a scandalous thing. And that's, that's exactly what we mean. It was, it, it's an idea that 40 years ago would have been subversive. Today, it's, it's completely part of the established Correct. order. Um, and, um, the, the other thing I think that's important to stress as, as I move ahead, um, Venus retrograde phases, even though they have this subversive quality, they can be equally, they can be good. They can be bad. That comes down to an individual perspective. Um, I've seen tremendous, like great tragic events happen during Venus, uh, retrograde periods, but also amazing triumphs and advancements. Um, so it, it really, it moves in the flow of that. And the, I, I, I mentioned this because I guess the word retrograde sounds a bit sinister, um, but it's important to, to, to maintain. I mean, as astrologers, when we're looking at individual horoscopes, that's when we start to decide whether things are good or bad or favorable or unfavorable. Um, but the universe is a lot more complex than simply taking one perspective and, and um, adhering to it as a, as a rule. Yeah, what I have found usually is status quo gets changed only when there is a shock treatment given. So that exactly. sometimes happens to be a tragedy or some severe incident where the exactly. mass consciousness really wakes up. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and now just um, um, also to continue with this theme, yeah. um, successful cyclical returns repeat themes in individual social life narratives. If uh, I'm going to be doing this a lot in our second interview, yeah. I'll, I'll be talking about people, how their entire lives, there would be a red one phase would always be really pivotal in their, yes. in, in the story of their life or a red three or what have you. I think one example just quickly was that Indira Gandhi's father and her son both died during the red three period. Right. And you can see, so one knows that those red three periods are always worth looking at. And when, one reads a, a biography of Indira Gandhi's life, one looks for uh, uh, events in her life happening during other Red Three right. periods because we already know that, that things sort of um, popped up in those, right. in those instances. And that's, that's sort of the method I use. Um, so it's very much like sort of every eight years as the cycle repeats itself, we find ourselves repeating something about our lives in a certain way, not necessarily the same circumstance and the same outcome. In fact, rarely just that, but uh, uh, grappling with the sort of the, the, um, the, the limitations and the definitions of what our horoscope represents, how it represents us as individuals. Would it be fair to say that we may undergo the same emotions during those periods, though the actual incident or event could be different? It, it, it can be, I think it's more the opposite. I think the circumstances are the same, but maybe our, our reactions to them are a bit different. Okay. Yeah, it's almost the, the reverse of that. Okay. Um, because, uh, and I mean, of course, Venus doesn't move in a vacuum. As it, even though I'm looking at it in, in this very isolated way, it's always interacting with planets. Right, right now, as you and I speak, I'm talking about us being in a blue four period. It's about to make this exterior conjunction with the sun in a couple of weeks. 
But, you know, right now Saturn is also right with the Sun and Venus, which was not true eight years ago yes. and won't be true eight years from now. And that gives this exterior conjunction in 2018 its it own obvious distinct character relative to what went on eight years ago or eight years or will happen eight years from now. Very so true. Um, they, they, we do still need to, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it in this very isolated way, but of course, sure. anytime we're looking at Venus in, in, the, in the sky, it's interacting with the planets. Right. And its relationship, it's given relationship to Mars or Saturn or Jupiter uh, at a given time will, will modify how it impacts the times and, you know, in the world in general, but also individual people's horoscopes. Right. All right. And uh, I think uh, this is, this is the, the last slide for now. And this, uh, you know, before we start discussing part two, yeah. um, is um, that the ultimately Venus, the, the cycle, what it seems to represent is an eventual integration of rival factions is, is it, it, um, it might, we might find ourselves at war and battling and, and from these very distinct groups, but its eventual purpose is to unify, that right. which is divided. Amazing. So there you go. That's, that's, that's our part one. This is just, a, like I said, a means of, of introducing you and your viewers to what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, why I'm doing it. And um, in our second interview, I want to talk a lot more about how this transit has operated in the lives of individual very true. people. Very, very eager to hear that. Okay, good. It's very good. clear. Basically, it's, uh, you know, you really explained the dance of Venus, I would call it, because mm -hmm. we are more used to that. And it's really amazing that it happens with such regularity. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, correlating with what happens in one's life is what you will be showing us next. Yes, yes. That's what I. That's what I have to show in the in the. It was a two. real pleasure having you, Nick. And well, thank you, Mohan. Uh, we'll soon have the part two. Yes. Thanks a lot as for uh, you your time, and I'm sure that uh, with this, people will start looking at uh, retrograde more and more eagerly as to what is really happening out there. In India, we talk a lot of retrogrades, and there are lots of theories as to how a retrograde planet really behaves. But this is something new and I would say for the first time we'll be seeing as to how it will be actually playing out to the public.